and welcome to episode 14 of Board Game Blitz, a podcast about all things board games that you can listen to in less time than it takes to prep your Y2K bunker. This week, we'll be discussing games we've played recently, like A Feast for Odin, Karuba, and Betrayal at House on the Hill, Widow's Walk. Then, we're going into the Wayback Machine to have a discussion about some games that we loved as kids, as well as games that were released prior to the turn of the century that are definitely still worth a look. And finally, we take a look at the etymology of the word board. And now, here are your hosts, Ambi, Cassidy, and me, Crystal. Last week, I got to play A Feast for Odin, which is a new game that came out this year, 2016, by Uwe Rosenberg, who is the designer of Agricola, Caverna, and Patchwork. And Patchwork was actually based on one of the mechanics in A Feast for Odin. So A Feast for Odin, I enjoyed it, but it's not something I would buy. It's a worker placement game where you place your workers and you end up getting these resources that are rectangular or tetris shaped pieces. And then you have a player board, which is a grid, and you can put the resources on the player board. So there's a spatial aspect in placing the resources on your board. And there's different rules you need to follow, like what order you can cover things in, and you get bonuses for covering every spot around certain spaces, and you get more income for covering more parts of your board. So I really enjoyed that part because I like spatial puzzles. But as I said last episode, I like games where the mechanics go well with the theme, and I didn't really feel any theme in this game. For example, some of the things you can do is upgrade your pieces into different colored pieces. And so a barrel got upgraded into a rune, like a rock with words on it. And so that doesn't really make sense to me. Yeah, that doesn't make sense to me either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there, there's lots of different ways to get points and lots of different things to do. But th- for me, everything felt a little disconnected. And also, it's a little more forgiving or a lot more forgiving than Agricola. So in Agricola, it's known for being really hard to feed your workers. But in A Feast for Odin, the harvest is automatic. So you just get food. Everyone gets food. And it doesn't feel as fulfilling to me because I didn't have to work hard to get that. I just get it automatically. So I like games where you have to work hard to get your um, rewards. I kind of wish I could just get food automatically. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that would be great in real life. <laughs> yeah, I'm just but gonna, in a I'm game, gonna, I want to work. I'm going to stare at my front door right now and will a pizza to appear. <laughs> <laughs> so then another part of Feast for Odin is there's cards that you draw that you can play to get you bonuses for different things. So I got really lucky that the cards that I got worked well together. There's part of the game is you get ships and you can go raiding. And I got cards that gave me bonuses for building ships and for going raiding. So that worked well together. But you can also get unlucky in the card draw, which could be a turnoff for some people. And some combos might be better than others. But because of the cards, there's a lot of variety in the game. So I've only played it once, but I can see like it could, there's a lot of variety and there's a bunch of different things you can do and they all give you points. So if you like games where there's a lot of options and you can get a lot of points, then you should try it probably. Yeah, I really want to play it. Like, really want to play it, so. (laughs) All right, well, I'm going to go in, like, the entire opposite direction of difficulty and talk about Karua, (laughs) which is a Haba game. Yay, Haba games. I'm going to be living with you forever (laughs) (laughs) soon-ish. So Karuba is a tile-laying game that has a really interesting bingo element. Each person has their own board and each person has people and temples in four different colors so you have a person and a temple of one color and another color and so on and so forth one player is designated the number color so they don't see their tiles they like draw them from a face down pile and then everybody plays the tile that has the same number on it and you can put it anywhere on your board And the goal is to get your little person of, say, the yellow color to your little temple, which really looks like a pile of poo. But anyway, (laughs) to get your little person to your little temple, and you want to do that as quickly as possible because the first person there is going to get the highest victory point bonus. And subsequently, each person that gets that color later is going to get a lower victory point. Goal at the end of the game is to have the most victory points. There are also tiles that have little gold pieces on them, and those are additional victory points if your little guy lands on those tiles. And that's Karuba in a nutshell. It's two to four players. It came out last year. And again, it's Haba Games, which in three years will be my life. 
<laughs> because baby. <laughs> I didn't realize Karuba was a Haba game. Yeah, I really didn't either until uh, recently, very recently. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't have that yellow box. The, uh, the first time I played Karuba, I was excited to play it. And then it, when we set it up and it was like, okay, so everyone has the people and the temples in the exact same spot. And we yep. all play the same tile each turn. I was kind of like, really? Like, that seems <laughs> too similar. And it's interesting to see how differently different people approach the game and where they place those tiles. Because even though you're going for the exact same people in the exact same places and you have the exact same tile to play, I don't think I've ever seen two boards that ended up like incredibly similar at the end of it. Like obviously there are some tile placements, especially toward the beginning, that end up being similar. But it's, it's a very cool game. And for a light game, it's really enjoyable. Yeah. I made like the biggest mistake ever in the last game I played and somehow basically cut my board in half with um, a line that I couldn't get across. <laughs> like, so I couldn't move my people from the left side of the board anywhere to their temples that were on the right side of the oh, board. No. I was like, how, what, why did I, how did I even do this? I was so upset with myself. I almost just like gave up on the game entirely. Oh. <laughs> But I really like Karuba. I just was dumb. <laughs> well, as I've mentioned before, I started playing board games back in 2007. Well, modern board games. And one of the first games that I was ever introduced to was Betrayal at House on the Hill, which was a 2004 release from Avalon Hill for three to six players. And now, 12 years later, an expansion to this game was just released in October. So just in case you aren't familiar with the base game, in Betrayal, players take on the roles of characters who are exploring a spooky, multi-level house, and they're encountering different events, and they're picking up items, and they're discovering these creepy omens. And at a certain point in the game, it changes when the haunt is triggered. And that usually turns one player into a traitor against the rest of the players. There are some haunts that are different where everyone is together or some other weird scenarios, but generally it's one against all at that point. The base game contained 50 different haunts that could occur, so the replayability was actually pretty high, but it's been out for 12 years now. So people who really like the game generally have seen all the haunts. And part of the fun is not having complete information because once you know exactly how the haunt works from both sides, it's usually not as much fun. Um, and a new expansion just came out called Widow's Walk and it adds new room tiles. It adds new cards to all of the decks for the game and it adds another 50 haunts, which were written by a really wide variety of people, both within and outside of the board gaming hobby. So I found that pretty interesting. Uh, most notably for me is uh, Pendleton Ward, the creator of Adventure Time, wrote one of the haunts. And I think that's super cool because I love Adventure Time. So I haven't run into that one yet, but I'm looking forward to it. The new room tiles are really good. They give you additional ways to boost your character's stats. They give you better ways to navigate through the house. And the new cards are interesting. They have some cool items with some neat abilities on them. For anyone who's not familiar with Betrayal, it has always kind of had the problem that there were some discrepancies in the rules or lack of information or confusion about how certain haunts worked. And because the game is fun, and it's different. I think people kind of forgave those facts, including myself. I love the game, even though I know that those flaws exist and they sometimes bother me. Like the trader will read one book and the rest of the group reads from a different book and everyone's given incomplete information. But sometimes that information is more unclear or incomplete than it should be. And that leads to some frustrating experiences, particularly for anyone who's new to the game. So, like, if you have never played before and you end up being the traitor, I think that that can be really tough, especially in a poorly written haunt. Um, and I was, truthfully, very excited about this expansion because I have to imagine that uh, Mike Selinker and Rob Davio and all the people who were involved in the original game were aware of those issues. And I optimistically thought they would avoid those issues in this new expansion. And... 
<clears throat> while I have not played most of the expansion or most of the haunts in the new expansion yet, so this could be entirely incorrect. Uh, based on my current experience with the expansion, as well as what I've heard from others online, they didn't fix it. They didn't fix it at all. In fact, it's kind of worse. And that really <laughs> bums me out because <clears throat> I love Betrayal a lot. And I'm still going to play it. So that's, do that does say something. But the, yeah, the rules, they're, <laughs> they're not good. They're not good at all. And that's really frustrating because the stories within these haunts are interesting. The concepts within them, the characters and... The experiences are nice and cool and fun and interesting, but if the mechanics aren't clearly explained, then we just sit there with our heads in our hands going, ah, oh, crap, how does this work? Well, I don't want to cheat, but I don't know if I'm allowed to do this or not. Like, I genuinely had an experience where I told, I was the traitor and I told the other, I'm not going to spoil any of the haunts for you guys, because really it's fun discovering them for the first time. But I told the good guys, I said, here's the deal. I want to do something. The book doesn't tell me whether I can or can't do it. I think I can, so I'm going to. But I want to let you guys know, I don't actually know if this is allowed or not. And they were fine with it, but I feel bad not knowing. So I'm going to play some more haunts. I will possibly provide an update later on if things change. But, and I hate being a downer on this game because really it's, it was one of my first modern board games. I own it. I still like it. I will still play it. But I really wanted this expansion to be better. And while it does improve on navigation in the house and some other things, the haunts are the, the heart of this game. And it's, it's not better, at least not yet. I hope some of them are super clear and wonderful. And I'll be able to come back and say that later. But for now, I would not recommend Widow's Walk unless you are a tried and true betrayal fan who knows exactly what you're getting into. If you go in knowing it's going to be tough and there's gonna, you're going to have to make some judgment calls, I think it's fine. If you like clear, concise rules, <laughs> it's definitely a pass for you. <laughs> so that is Betrayal at House on the Hill, Widow's Walk. Yeah, I've played a few times and I've enjoyed my time playing and I think it's because I was never been the betrayer. But I have a hard time not being able to just like find the rule that I'm looking for. So it's definitely uh, not one of my favorites. I mean, because for me, like, I really, I am, I'm a goody two shoes. So I don't <laughs> like to cheat. And, you know, sometimes people quote unquote cheat unintentionally by either not hearing something or not reading something or misunderstanding. And when I know that I just have to make a choice, I, it drives me crazy. Like, I want the game to tell me if this is allowed or not. And sometimes, at least in this, it was things that, mo it wasn't even like little vague one-off occasional things. It was a key part of the haunt and like what the good guys had to do to win wasn't even explained clearly. Like they literally were like, okay, so we have to do this, but we don't know how to do it. Yeah. Yeah, that's frustrating, but what can you do? For this week's thematic game segment, we wanted to hop into the Wayback Machine, as it were, and travel back in time. A time when things were simpler, when there was no Kickstarter, there weren't thousands of games being released every year. And I can't believe that that's an accurate statement. That's not even hyperbole. Literally thousands of games come out nowadays. <laughs> that's crazy. So we wanted to talk about games that came out prior to the turn of the century that are still really good and that if you haven't played them or you haven't even seen them sitting around because they're not the new hotness, you should seek them out because they're awesome. So, Ambie and Cassidy, what are some of your all's favorite, well, favorite games that came out prior to the year 2000? Uh, I really like Bonanza. Bonanza is probably still one of my top 10 favorite all-time ever games. Bonanza's a lot of fun. Yeah, it came out in 97 love that bean game i mean because it's a card game it's simple it's quick it's easy to teach uh, and until you tell everybody they can't change the order of the cards in their hand and you watch magic players freak out <laughs> <laughs> that literally happened to my husband because he's a magic player and mm -hmm. yeah knowing that he can't shuffle the cards around in his hand was like ah <laughs> I think it's a great intro to hand management. 
that's a good point. Yeah. One game that I like that came out in the 1900s is 1830. So I've already talked about 18xx games before, but 1830 came out in 1986. And a bunch of 18xx games came out after that, and they're still coming out with new ones. But 1830 still holds up, and I enjoy it a lot. This is, again, my lack of knowledge about 18xx games, but what, when was the, do you know when the first 18xx game was released? Or if that is, like, kind of the first big one? I think 1830 was the, might have been the second one. The first one was 1829, I think, which came out in 1974. And then 1830 was the most popular one. And 1829 kind of died out. Okay, so 1830 kind of knocked it out knocked it into obscurity to some degree yeah it said forget you 1829 it's all about 1830 <laughs> yeah that's a bigger number so <laughs> i well, okay so a few episodes ago we talked about our shame games uh games that we've never played before and one of the games that we mentioned that all three of us had never played was el grande which came out in 1995. So it is a pre-2000 game, and it is a classic, and it is a beloved game by a whole bunch of people. And I finally got to play it! So that's Yay. super exciting. And I have to say, even with... kind, I mean, admittedly, it's not like people are talking about it on a daily basis, but there's a decent amount of hype, considering that game is now more than 20 years old, and it's still very highly rated on Board Game Geek. People do still talk about it. They do still play it. And all of that is completely justified. That game is super awesome. So the three of us are maybe going to have to play that at MeepleCon in March, because I definitely want to play it again. And to me, it is one of those games that the mechanics are strong enough that even people like me who are generally more thematic gamers can get a lot of enjoyment out of it because it's just a really well-made game. Mm. So those are a few games that are pretty awesome that came out pre-2000, but not all of the gaming that we did pre-2000 consisted of awesome games because (laughs) we were kids. Well, I mean, technically I was a teen at the end of the I started my freshman year of high school in 1999, so, uh, but a good part of my childhood was in the 80s and 90s, and I played some games that were not awesome, but that I still have fond memories of. <laughs> um, I've t- we've talked about a decent number of dexterity games um, on our podcast before, and a game that I really liked as a kid that I would, that is definitely a dexterity game, is something that I pretty much have never, it fell off the map completely. And that is Arch Rival. Arch Rival came out in 1992. And it was published by Parker Brothers. So that is not super surprising. It is a mass market game. Basically, you like built this arch out of these little hollow bucket pieces. And then you had to roll two dice and put these cool see-through neon weird shaped pieces into different buckets in the arch and whoever knocked it over lost. So kind of similar to your Jenga's or Kerplunk's or stuff like that. Um, Not, you know, not a lot of strategy there, obviously, but you could like make people put stuff in specific colors and things like that. The neon pieces were pretty cool looking, but yeah, I don't, I guess there's just better dexterity games that exist now. So that's probably why that one didn't stick around. But as a kid, I really liked it. Yeah. I used to play a lot of, family games with my family when I was a kid, like the classics, Monopoly, Clue, Pictionary, Risk. But my favorite game when I was like two or three was The Little Mermaid, which is a terrible game, but I really <laughs> liked it. <laughs> it. It's based on The Little Mermaid movie, and you just spin and move, and if you land on certain colors, you, like, you get to move Ariel up and you want to move her up to become a human, and that's it. Um, and I would always make my family play it with me. It's like she's escaping the water, right? Because she's moving up yeah. out of the water. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's all, it's, it's kind of like shoots and ladders where you just like spin, spin and, and move, move, and that's it. But I really liked it. If you were at a thrift store 
say next week or at a you know a board game convention where people had some games for sale and there was a copy of it available <laughs> for a cheap price you know obviously not a lot of money uh would you pick it up i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i'm so not sure probably. if my parents still have it <laughs> that's how that's how i got my copy of the omega virus is when i was home visiting uh-huh. my parents for like the holidays at one point after i had moved away i was like I wonder, and I went and looked in, like, the basement closet where, like, everything goes to, you know, die forever, and I was like, it's here! I was so excited. <laughs> um, one of my fondest gaming memories as a small child is playing the memory little card game where you're literally just flipping over things and trying to find matches, but I used to play this with my aunts for hours when she'd come into town, which wasn't frequently because she lived out of state so i have very very fond memories of that game even though there's literally nothing to it but it came out in 1959 um they're still making versions of it even now which is crazy i mean i think matching games are great for small kids so yeah yeah i think probably my earliest gaming story came from a game of uh, Balderdash that I played. It was me and my sister and my best friend and her best friend who happened to be sisters as well. So that worked out well. And in Balderdash, you're making up fake definitions to real words that nobody would know the definitions of because they're ridiculous. Although I wonder if at this point in my life, I might know more of them, but who knows? Anyway, I don't know what the word was, but when it came up, I completely made up the answer of something along the lines of your your mother's brother's uncle's cousin first removed or something just the whole big old string of you know familial connections and when we went to read all the answers the actual answer was not the exact na- words that I named, but it was a big, weird string of familial connections, and it blew our child <laughs> minds like. We, like, the fact that I got it basically right for all intents and purposes without knowing was ridiculous to us. And it was, like, the (laughs) coolest moment of my young life as a gamer. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Balderdash is really fun. We actually used to play, we didn't know that Balderdash existed, but we used to play a game that we called the Dictionary Game, which is basically the same thing. And we would take our dictionary, our big, huge dictionary, and then pick a word from it. And that person would be the one who knows the word and everyone else would make it up. That was really fun. <laughs> That's cool because then you yeah. can kind of cherry pick some interesting yeah. ones. Because there were times in Balderdash, I feel, when the words were kind of boring or when the, the definition was so, like, nobody would ever come up with it. It was too obviously the right one. Mm-hmm. So doing it from a dictionary actually sounds pretty fun. Yeah. I have a really fun story from gaming in before, you know, the 2000s. Uh, in middle school, I had to give a presentation on a book that I read, and I read uh, one of the Dragon Riders of Pern books, and instead of just giving a boring old school reading presentation thing, I made a board game out of it. That's awesome. <laughs> wow. I remember literally zero things about it at this point in time, but I remember that I loved it, and it was awesome. So you're technically a board game designer. It's a true story. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. There's And there's definitely other games pre-2000 that I would definitely recommend to people. Stuff like uh, Survive Escape from Atlantis or Robo Rally or Raw, the Reiner Knizia classic. I know, Ambie, you're, you're a fan of Crokinole. Is that right? Oh, yeah. But yeah, I don't think of these because I didn't play that before 2000. So it's hard. That's to what's, yeah, remember. it's interesting because when we discover these things later, yeah, it's hard. Like, that's the thing when I looked and I was like, wait, El Grande came out in 1995. That kind of blew my mind a little. So mm-hmm. if any of our listeners have any games that they really love, whether they be good, quote unquote, g- good games or like childhood favorites or anything like that, please feel free to post them in the guild thread on Board Game Geek about this episode because we'd love to hear what your all's favorite older games are. Because I think, you know, we do tend 
not just us as a podcast, but we as a hobby do kind of tend to get caught up in the new hotness because there are so many awesome games that are coming out on a regular basis. And I think it is nice to take a step back and look at, you know, some of those older games. They're they're a little older. Maybe they're a little slower. Maybe they're not quite as flashy. But, Maybe they're uh, in their s- 30s. <laughs> yeah, right? That does not mean that they're worthless. <laughs> For today's board game etymology, we're going to examine the origins of the word board. Board is a Germanic word that comes from the Old English word board, spelled B-O-R-D, meaning a plank or flat surface. That word is related to the Dutch word board, B-O-O-R-D, as well as the German word bort, B-O-R-T. And it is also reinforced by the Old French word, also bort, which means edge or a ship's side, as well as the Old Norse word borth, meaning a board or table. The first known use of the term board game, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, occurred in 1889, although games played on boards date back to prehistoric days. In fact, board games actually predate written language. So people were playing games with each other before they even knew how to write each other a letter. And that's kind of cool. We wanted to give a shout out to Mor Lamar and SN621, who gave us a couple of awesome reviews on iTunes. We don't know who you are, but we love you. We if love any- you. You're awesome. <laughs> Yay. If anyone else likes our show and wants to give us a review on iTunes, it's a little hard to do, but we'd appreciate it. Using the search feature on the iTunes app on your phone, search for our podcast by name, click the icon and, uh, to take you to our podcast main page, click the reviews tab, then click leave a review. Positive reviews help make our podcast more visible to others, so we greatly appreciate anyone who takes the time to do this for us. You're the best! Yes. Woohoo! <laughs> And that's it for this week's Board Game Blitz. Visit our website, BoardGameBlitz.com, to get links to all our social media pages, including our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Board Game Geek Guild. Our theme song was composed by Andrew Morrow. Technical support provided by Toby Mao. Have suggestions for the show? Shoot us an email at BoardGameBlitz at gmail.com. Until next time, they may take our lives, but they'll never take our podcast! Bye, everyone! Bye! Bye! One game I like that came out pre this millennium, or <laughs> is that, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> in this week, in this week, damn it. <laughs> this is horrible. No more night recording. <laughs> or more because yeah. it's entertaining. All right, take three. <laughs> Until next time. They may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! (laughs) Bye, everyone! You said freedom! Bye! Bye. You didn't say freedom! (laughs) Okay, no, no, I'll start again. Uh, Until next time. Now we have our blooper. (laughs) (laughs) And you were so into it, too. You were like, freedom! Oh, I wish yeah. we had video to go along with that, just just for the blooper. Like, yeah, that would be good. That was good. <clears throat> I liked it a lot. Okay.